Now, today, uh, we want to just conclude our series. Has it been a good series? Has it been useful? You know, I love Mavuno Church because it's a place where we're real people, uh, real issues, a real God. We're people with, we're, we're real people. We don't need to pretend to be something we're not. Uh, we're real people, and we have real issues. Look at your neighbor. Do they look like they have issues? That's because they're wearing their Sunday best. Trust me, they have serious issues. We all have serious issues. We don't try to pretend to be what we're not. But we thank God because we have a real God. And that God is able to deal with any issues we bring to Him. We don't have to try to be anything to pretend to be what we're not. Uh, he's an amazing God who's able to bring, as we, re- as we bring our real issues to Him, He's able to receive those issues and transform us and help us be everything we're supposed to be. So we've been talking about Between the Sheets. And that's what our series has been, uh, really talking about how do we reclaim God's design for sex. And we've been learning a lot of things. We've learned about the fact that God created sex for intimacy, not for shame. Because many times what happens when we use uh, sex outside God's design, the result is shame. Uh, But God did not design it for that. We've also talked about the fact that God designed sex for bonding. That there's a certain unity and a union and an intimacy that God designed this thing for. But then when we misuse it, it results in bondage. And today we'll talk a bit more about that. Last Sunday we were talking about how to turn out illicit fires. And we talked about the fact that sin is crouching. Sin is always crouching, always wants to devour us. But we can subdue it. Uh, We have the power as God's people to subdue it. So today, I want to conclude by talking about a topic that's very, very relevant in the era in the time that we live in, and that is pornography and masturbation. I want to talk about traps that ensnare. Tell your neighbor, there are traps that ensnare. Yeah. There are actually traps in our society that are out to ensnare us. And one of the fundamental challenges with this topic is there really arguments about, is this thing really, are these things as dangerous as Christians sometimes try to make them out to be? You know, one of the things that people sometimes argue is when you engage yourself in watching pornography, it's a, it's a private thing. It's an, you, you, you're a consenting adult. You're not hurting anybody else. Surely, why, why should this be seen as something that is wrong? And other people, even, even professionals, by the way, uh, people who we look up to, psychologists, people who write in even eminent journals, and some of them will actually say uh, that they recommend pornography, watching and masturbation, as things that are supposedly good for you. And I've actually read uh, some psychologists who go as far to say that there are medical benefits to masturbation. And they talk about things like, you know, uh, lowering the risk of prostate cancer, (laughs) boosting immunity, preventing anxiety, helping you fall asleep, improving your heart health and your skin, and improving your mood. Surely, if doctors have said that, who are you? Who are you to say something different? And you're going to find that all this stuff is out on the internet and it's not stuff that is hidden. Another reason that people will criticize when you try to talk about these issues is to say the Bible doesn't explicitly talk about uh, masturbation and porn. There's no verse that says thou shalt not masturbate. Have you ever read a verse like that? Oh, guys, are we in the same church? Guys, I, I feel like I walked in another church and everyone's looking shocked that the pastor is saying certain words in the pulpit. Is, have you ever read a verse like that? No. There's no verse that says, thou shalt not watch porn. There's nothing like that in the scripture. So sometimes people are like, why are you making a big deal out of something that scripture doesn't make a big deal out of? So some of these are some of the things that you will hear people uh, talk or say when the church or when Christians try to talk about these issues of porn and masturbation. But I want to just say this right from the beginning, that for us, if we're to base our perspective from God's word, we understand that sexual sin is gratifying sexual desires outside God's design. So when we gratify our sexual desires outside God's design, then we venture into the place of sin, and sin is rebellion. It's choosing to take what was meant for something and using it for something it was not meant for, and doing it willfully. And when we do that, we, begin to, we, we, we lose the fact, uh, the sense that sex is a gift from God. It's a beautiful thing that God gave. Uh, to be enjoyed by a man and a woman within the context of marriage. And when we defy that, then when we, when, we, when we move outside the boundaries of that, then we start to run into uh, some serious issues. Now, I want to look at a scripture today. We've been looking at Genesis, and we've said that when you're talking about sex, it's, 
extremely important that you start from the beginning. You don't just take a, t a, a, a verse uh, and, and pull another verse. That it's important to go back to the beginning because then you begin to understand the context, what sex was intended for. And we began by looking at Genesis 1 to 2, uh, seeing God's design for sex. We looked at Genesis 3, what happens, and actually Genesis 4 last week, what happens when humans go outside God's boundaries. Today I want us to look at Genesis chapter 6, and it's a scripture that closely follows the ones we've been reading. And we want to look at a very, very interesting um, scripture that I believe speaks about, uh, gives us some guidelines, I would say, for us to address these traps that ensnare. And Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to 8, it says, Then the people began to multiply on earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women, and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh, in the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. God was like, these guys are living too long. They have too much time to think about bad things to do. And so I'm going to shorten their lifespan. And in those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and total, totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing. All the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry around the, along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I'm sorry I ever made them. Verse 8, but Noah found favor with the Lord. Just allow me to pray as we begin. Father, I just want to ask that this word, the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, the things I share today will be pleasing to you. And we ask that, Father, knowing that the enemy does not want your message to reach your people, that the, the message of this world, the God of this world, desires to confuse us on these issues. I pray that, Father God, that for every one of us, you would allow your Holy Spirit to speak directly to our spirit. And that, Lord, you would confirm this as your word. And I pray that today there will be victory in the house, that the enemy will have no voice here. We declare that this is an altar of God, and we paralyze every deceiving voice in this compound, and we declare that only God's word would be heard in this place today, for we ask this in Jesus' name, and God's people say it. Amen. This passage tells us that a time came when humans began to multiply greatly, and at the same time, sin and wickedness, rebellion against God were also multiplying greatly. And we are told that the sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Now, I just need to say that this passage is a, it's actually a controversial passage because, first of all, you understand, as you read it, you could see it has some things there that are just hard to explain what's really going on. First of all, who are these sons of God? Uh, because the Bible doesn't tell us very explicitly who they are. Uh, theologians are, are divided on this issue. Some people think that these were fallen angels, like demonic spirits, uh, that... Uh, and angels in the Bible are called uh, uh, sons of God. So people, some people feel that these were like spiritual beings uh, that came and had intercourse with, with, uh, uh, with human uh, women. Uh, others feel like these were powerful human rulers uh, who took advantage of these uh, young ladies. Others still feel like these were descendants of Seth. Seth was the son of Adam and Eve after Abel was killed. And, uh, and, and there's this sense that his, his generation, the people, because even actually when you read the genealogies of Scripture, they, they're descended not from Cain, but from Seth. And so some people feel like this was actually Seth's generation uh, of righteous men, uh, but then the, the, the daughters that they eyed were from Cain's line. Now, all this is just speculative, and a lot of it, I mean, the Bible doesn't actually say, so we don't really know. That's really the answer. But regardless of what, who these sons of God were, I think it's very clear that this is a dramatic story. The implication is that there's a group that had the privilege of being in a relationship of sonship to God who are willing to reject that relationship and step down from it for the, for the pursuit of sexual gratification. That's, that's what comes out. It doesn't tell us who exactly they were, but it tells us that they had a sonship. But they were willing to give up their sonship for the sake of sexual gratification. And I don't, I, I don't know if that's something, whether it's something that is very far removed from the world we live in today, that this is something that perhaps you've seen happen around, where people will give up their relationship with God 
for the sake of sexual gratification. Am I talking to people who live on the planet Earth? Yeah, we've, seen, we've even seen men of God fall and, and give up their calling, give up their anointing simply because of this thing, sexual gratification. And regardless of what you, I mean, regardless of, of, of who these sons of God was, I want to share with you the five S's of sexual sin. I'm going to talk about the five S's today. Uh, each of these things begin with an S. Because I see a, a, a trajectory, something happening, uh, a, 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 something that comes out of this passage that I think is very typical of what happens to us when we engage, especially in pornography and masturbation. But I think also just generally in sexual sin. What happens every time you pursue sexual sin? Number one, the first S, you get sucked in. You get sucked in. It says to us that the sons of God saw the beautiful women. That's where everything went downhill. What did they do? They saw, right? Okay, let me ask just in case you missed that one. What did they do? They saw. I mean, these sons of God, they were moving around, doing their own business, serving God, being godly, and doing all the things that sons of God are meant to do. And then, the problem, they saw. You know, sexual sin always begins by sucking you in. There's always that moment that it sucks you in. Pornography sucks you in with the promise of something beautiful, something exciting, something that helps you, it promises you escape, or acceptance, or arousal, or entertainment, something that, there's just something that it promises that you don't have right now. Something exciting is about to happen. And you know, we said last week, uh, I, I said this in the second service, I didn't say it in this service, but for men, there's a wire that goes directly from their eyes to their genitals. I think this service, guys are still waking up. <laughs> there's just a thing, men, men are attracted by their eyes. And most men who fall into sexual sin, the problem starts with their eyes. They see. And when they see, what they do afterwards is what leads them into sin. By the way, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with seeing. We all see. But what do you do? The, second, the, thing, the, the thing you do immediately after you see is what leads men into trouble. We say it for women. It's not, a, it's not a wire from their eyes. It starts from their ears, goes directly to their heart. And that's why women's sin always starts with sweet words. Sweet affirmations. That guy in the office who tells you, ah, seriously? And how did you feel when he said that? <laughs> ah, you don't look okay. Are you, are you really okay? And you're like, oh my God, my husband never asked me that all these years. We've been, ah, 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 ah. You're already going at that point as a woman. And so we are saying, you know, for, we are different. But it always begins with a promise. Because the promise you're getting in that conversation there is, there's someone who accepts me as I am. It's, it's offering you something you don't have. There's an excitement that starts to happen where you feel there's something I don't have that I'm being offered. And this wire passes through your brain and it releases chemicals. Chemicals like dopamine. For women, there's a chemical called oxytocin. These are the chemicals of love. And these chemicals, what do they do? They dilate your blood vessels. They cause your heart to start beating. They cause your throat to get dry. <laughs> you start feeling great. You start feeling powerful. You start feeling possibility. You awaken. And you know, that, that, and, and whether it's a rela a, an illicit look, a touch, whether it's a word that was said to your ears, whether you saw a pop-up on the internet, there's something that's released when you, and it sucks you in. So the first S is you're sucked in. You're sucked in. The second S is that you get stuck. You get stuck. You're sucked in, but then you get stuck. All that, all that these sons of God had on their minds was how to gratify their sexual desire. They saw these beautiful women, and they were like, wah, 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 wah. They were salivating. They're like, wah. And that's all I want is just to have this beautiful woman. That's all they wanted. But what seems is the result of this story is none of them ever regained their position again. You don't read about these sons of God becoming known as sons of God after that. There's no mention of redemption or restoration. Once they entered that path, they were stuck into it. And one of the realities of pornography and masturbation that many people don't understand, and many times the psychologists who write about its benefits don't tell you, is how addictive these habits are. They, they, they psychologically mirror taking a powerful drug like cocaine or heroin. Because these chemicals that are released in your blood, they have the same impact. They actually have the same impact as taking a hit of a powerful drug. Anyone who's interacted with porn has engaged in masturbation. 
they understand with clarity that these are some of the easiest things to get addicted to. And what happens is once they become a habit, they are extremely hard to break. I can't tell you how many people I've prayed over, I've prayed with, who are in that place where it's like I sin, I confess, and then I go back and I sin again. Because it's just like it, it, you're in a bondage. You're held. They actually hold you. And of course, that provides a huge business opportunity. Uh, there are capitalists who make millions of dollars because of that addiction. Uh, there's a big business opportunity. They, they say the porn industry is worth over 100 billion US dollars. That's about the size of the Kenyan economy, by the way. In other words, the, porn, the global porn industry is like the full productivity, including borrowing, of 54 million Kenyans. All of us working and hustling day and night. And the money we make, plus all the money we borrowed from China and everybody else, that's what the global industry is making. And that global industry is controlled by a few powerful people. There are people who are benefiting from that bondage. They make an astronomical amount of money off people's addiction. You know, in psychology, they speak about a rule called the quickest, the, 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 e the earlier, quicker rule. The earlier, quicker rule. And what that rule says is the earlier you engage in an addictive behavior, the quicker you get stuck into it. Wow. So if you start drinking in, in primary school, chances are you will get addicted much faster and you, it, you will stay addicted much longer. That's what that rule means. Now, statistics tell us that 90% of children 8 to 16 years old today have viewed porn. 90%. 8 to 16 have viewed porn. If you have a child who fits in that category, chances are they have actually viewed porn. I know. You know, it's so interesting because, and I, 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 I try to move quickly, because in, in, I remember um, we had, we had an event for young, for, for, for kids uh, at church. And I remember my wife telling the, the youth pastor, uh, you need to talk about porn and sex. And say, this is the kind of content you need to be discussing. And the youth pastor said, ah, ah, my kids, that's too much. Like, I couldn't talk to my kids about that. And then they had, they had a meeting with those kids. They had, a, they had an event with those kids. And the pastor came to my wife, shattered. And he said, give me the material you had. Because I started talking to these kids, and I realized, oh, my God, they know even more than I know. Wow. And these were kids about 13 years old. So this is, a, this is a quicker, faster rule. And, and what's happening is our children today, the younger generation, this is their state. Wow. This is the state they find themselves in. Talk about being stuck. They say the largest consumers of porn in the world today are boys 12 to 17 years old. Talk about being stuck. So you get stuck. That's a whole generation of stuckness, isn't it? And then the next step after getting stuck, the third S is you get into a spiral. Wow. The, the stuckness becomes a spiral. Verse 5 reads... The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Consistently and totally evil. Now remember, the poor sons of God, all they wanted was just desiring a, 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 a beautiful girl. All they were salivating was just a sexual encounter. That's all they wanted. But they found that once they opened that door, they landed on a slippery slope. They couldn't go back up. It's not where they began. This is not who they were. This is not what their identity was. But they found that after that, everything they touched just became, I mean, they got to the place where everything that was thought, everything that they were and everything that they touched became consistently and totally evil. That's a downhill slope. It's not where they had begun. And that's what happens. When our bodies experience that high that comes from those chemicals, the dopamine, the oxytocin, what happens? Your body is wired to crave for more. You see, our bodies were, were designed for good things. That's why some of you like soft life. You, you don't realize soft life is actually supposed to be a sign to show you are built for heaven. Because there's nothing on earth that can satisfy your desire for soft life. That's why you see people with 15 cars in the garage and they're still desiring to make more money. You're, you're, desi you're filling a hole in you with something that can't fill it. So when you begin to uh, uh, engage with pornography, bas basically those chemicals are released, the chemicals that are supposed to be there when you experience the intimacy with God, with your spouse. And when those chemicals come out, guess what? Your body just demands more. Wow. It wants more. But here's the thing that also happens, that your body also develops resistance to protect you. And so what happens is, the next time you come, because you're looking for that escape, that, that, that feeling you had, that sense of power that you had that you didn't have before, you come back and you do the same thing, and you don't get the same high. 
because your body has developed a resistance. And so you're going to find that with time, you have to do more and more and increasingly more in order to get the same hit that you got before. And this is the psychology of addiction. You have to go farther and farther in in order to get the same level of high. And this is what we've become. We've become a community where things that would have been shocking a few years ago now are commonplace. And they're seen as normal in society. Uh, whether it's swinging relationships or open marriages where different couples meet and exchange partners for a more gratifying sexual experience, those things would have been shocking in Nairobi a little while back. Today they are commonplace. There are things that people talk about on radio and it's just like they, they share their experiences. Uh, whether it's orgies where groups of people have sexual encounters together, whether it's sex sexually explicit conversations on our airwaves. You know, it's interesting, when I went to Uganda for the first time, I was talking to my sister from Uganda, I remember reading the red paper. It's a, it's a newspaper that's like a, 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 a tab tabloid. Oh my God, I remember dropping it. It was so, I was like, how can, why would anyone, how would, how would you do this in public? It was shameful, like when I read it. I was, just, I was like, nobody in Kenya would ever read this. It was so shocking. I was like, how could they even be allowed by the government to publish this? Shock on me. Nairobians today. I think we're even further, we're even past the Ugandans today in our explicitness. And it's just, that's what happens, is what before was seen as shocking, today is normal. And you know what's happening is tomorrow, what's shocking today will not be shocking anymore. Because today, even today, there are still a few things that are still shocking. But guess what's happening? They are becoming more and more accepted. And you see that in the West, where people are doing crazy things. Where somebody will say, I identify as a cat. Or I, or, or, or I want to marry my dog. And then get really offended that you don't, you don't understand that they can marry their dog. Because that's what the things that were seen, things that today we are laughing at, guess what's happening? We are getting there as well. Why? Because you need that extra high. You need that. Somehow the things that were, 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 were fulfilling in the past are no longer fulfilling today. And many times that's what happens. The high that was in a pornographic film, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing. So, so here's the other thing that also happens. The, the, the thing you need to understand with pornography, pornography is acted. Okay, I'm sorry to break your bubble. It's never real. It's like WWE, the wrestling you watch on TV. There's nothing real in that thing. It's not real. I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so sad to break your hearts. That wrestling thing, they act it. They actually, they actually just go and rehearse, and then they play it for you. And they make tons of money. Same, same with pornography. It's all acted. And for them to make money, they have to make it look amazing. And so everything you see there, the makeup, the lights, the action, everything is, it's all acted out. It, in fact, they say that most porn actors take drugs. Because the things that you're being asked to do, you cannot do normally. Wow. So guess what happens? You're addicted to this. And then guess what happens after that? You get into a relationship with your spouse. And guess what happens? Your spouse can never do those things. They're, your spouse is not a paid actor. <laughs> and they're not on drugs. Yeah? Are you seeing the problem you're landing yourself into? So, so, so basically what's happening is the sexual sin is just leading into, into a spiral. Worse and worse and worse. And pornography consumption, engaging in masturbation, always leads to a, a spiral where we desire more and become more and more willing to engage in more and more risky behavior. So you get stuck, you get sucked in, number two, you get stuck, and then number three, you get into a spiral. But number four, you get separated. You get separated, that's the fourth S. This is the most significant and detrimental outcome of engaging in sexual sin, because it destroys your relationship. It destroys your relationship with God, and it destroys your relationship with others, including the spouse that you are longing for, the person that you're longing to connect with. It says in verse 6 to 7 that the Lord was sorry he ever made them. You remember all these sons of God wanted was just to have a sexual encounter. But it gets to the place where the Lord was sorry he ever made them and put them on earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I've created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing. All people, all large animals, the small animals that scurry around the ground, even the birds of the sky, I'm sorry I ever made them. It's like, how, how, did, how did we get here? Imagine that. Humans have moved from Genesis chapter 1 where God makes them out of love. And he says, I want to make them in my own image. He breathes his own life into them. He makes them unique out of all the creatures. He loves them. 
But now the perfect relationship that he had with them is completely damaged. There's actually just a, a, a regret in his heart that he even began this conversation. You see, porn destroys relationships. Sexual sin destroys relationships. Not just with God, but with each other. And, 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 and like I said, one of the things that happens is you begin to find that in your, it, 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 for, for those who are planning to get into uh, relationships, uh, there are terms nowadays that psychologists use that are very interesting. I find them very interesting, but they are descriptive. One of those terms is intimacy anorexia. I don't know if you've ever read a term like that. But basically what in, intimacy anorexia is, it's a situation where people no longer know how to give or receive real intimacy. They don't even know how to. You're married to somebody, but you don't even know how to be intimate. Why? Because the experience of sex you have exposed yourself to did not require intimacy. It was a purely physical act, and you got your release without any intimacy. And what that did, it taught you how not to be intimate. It taught you, it, it starved you of the thing you were looking for. And so you find that many people have engaged in, in acts of sex that don't require warmth, that don't require intimacy, don't require self-giving. And so many people enter into marriage and they find they don't even know how to give emotional intimacy in their marriages. And, 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 and what happens is that as long as their quota for physical expression is met, that's all they know. Because for them, sex is a physical thing. So they enter into their marriage and they're wondering, why is it that I can't become close to my wife? Why is it that she doesn't fulfill me? Why is it that she doesn't satisfy me? You see, what's happening is you, your marriage becomes dry and desolate and loveless. And before long, you're talking about irreconcilable differences. And what you don't realize is that you are the one who drained your pot of intimacy wow. long before you entered into the marriage. Are you seeing some of the dangers of this thing? Oh, yeah. This is what the psychologists will not tell you when they're giving you all the spin that they give you. And I believe by the way, some of these psychologists, you need to be very careful because big porn has a lot of money. They will pay for those psychological assessments on the internet. Wow. You, you need to be critical consumers, God's people. Another thing is, because like I said, porn paints this hyper-realistic view of, of, of sexual encounters. You find that your spouse cannot fulfill you because she can't perform the way that the video performs. And so at some point you realize that you have to get into more and more risky sexual behavior in order to be sexually satisfied in your marriage. And so you find yourself in that situation where one person is kind of trying to force the other person to do crazier and crazier things. And the other person is feeling imposed on. They're feeling like they're being forced to do things they're not even comfortable doing. And they're wondering, where is this all coming from? But this is where it, also, it, it, it breaks down. And many people end up getting into affairs and entering into risky sexual behaviors. Why? Because this is where that risk, that dopamine hit that they got from the videos can be found. It can't be found in, in fact, they are bored in their married relationship. Some, some, some couples I even know have, by the way, where this person who was addicted to porn draws their spouse in to watch porn with them. And they say, but surely, I mean, we're both doing it, we're both consenting adults. You don't realize that actually you're both dooming your relationship. Wow. Uh, two wrongs will never make a right. You actually now both enter the spiral. And that does not help either. So one of our pastors said this, and I think uh, he's, he's called Pastor Jerry Rollins. I once heard him say this, and I don't, I'll never forget this. He says, sexual sin always takes you farther than you planned to go, costs you more than you intended to pay, and keeps you longer than you intended to stay. I, I think that one you should take a screenshot of. If you're, if you're taking, just, just, take, just, just take that one down. Because I think this is something, by the way, I really hope this series is also giving you content that you will discuss with other people. Some of you have nieces and nephews. You need to actually call them and have this content with them, the conversations we're having. Because the best way to learn it is by teaching it to others. Sexual sin will always take you farther than you plan to go, costs you more than you intended to pay, and keeps you longer than you intended to stay. So you get sucked in, you get stuck, you get into a spiral, and you get into that place where we call separated. You get separated. And then the fifth S is, and I, so let me just say this about the, the fifth S. I like the fifth S. Because the fifth S is where hope comes. We can get salvation. We can get salvation. And I want to say that very, very openly to everybody in this church. There is salvation. There's nobody who is so stuck that God cannot unstuck you. Verse 8 says, but Noah found favor with the Lord. I love that verse. Because in the middle of our, a, a world that had gone mad, where everything was crazy, everything was hypersexualized, everything was lost, where even God was just in regret, there was a person who found it in himself to say, I will choose to honor God with my body. I will choose to live differently from my culture around me. 
And the Bible says that Noah found favor with the Lord. I believe that even in the wickedness of the crazy culture we're living in today, there are still men and women who God is looking at who will choose to say, I choose to honor God with my body. I choose to follow God's plan and not the craziness of the culture around me. Maybe you're a student and you're listening to this message. I want to put it to you that you can choose to walk a different path from everyone else in your college or your school. You can choose to walk in purity even though nobody in your whole university is doing so. And everybody thinks you're crazy. Yes, you can. You can be the Noah that finds favor with God. You can choose to honor God with your body and decide that his favor is more important than anything your culture offers you. Yes, you can. Are there any students in the house? Yeah, I'm speaking to you. You can choose to be different. You're here and you're not married. You can choose to be abstinent until you find your spouse, until God helps you find your spouse. This is what honors God. And his desire for you is that irrespective of all the TV shows are telling you and all that your culture is throwing at you, that you will choose to be celibate. And, and when people say that being a virgin is outdated, being celibate is not normal, that you'll be one of those people who shows that actually I can be different. The Bible says, but Noah found favor with the Lord his God. You can choose to honor God with your body and decide his favor is more important than anything your culture is throwing at you. I want to say I believe that there are Noahs in this church. You're here and you're struggling with same-sex attraction. Let me just say, we didn't talk about same-sex attraction this whole series. But it's a huge, massive issue in our culture today, in the culture we live in. But listen, I want to say this. I always distinguish between attraction to same sex, somebody of the same sex and acting out on that attraction. Because remember, we say the eye is not the problem. What you do with what you see is where the problem comes in. And you can choose, as somebody who has a same-sex attraction, to choose not to act out on that same-sex attraction. You can choose to be celibate and to live a life that honors God. And you can choose to honor God with your body and decide that his favor is more important than any affirmation the culture is throwing at you. You can choose it, by the way. I believe you can have that, and it's a broken thing for sure, but there are many people who are broken with sexual addictions. And I believe that the, that the talk and the call of God on their lives is the same as the one in your life. That you can choose to honor God with your body still. You're here and you're married. In a world where marriage means nothing. I remember at family night this week, somebody said, one of the ways that I introduce myself to people, uh, so they stop bothering me sexually is by saying, by the way, I'm married. Do you understand that we live in a culture nowadays when you show your ring and you become more attractive to some people? There's some people who actually see you as a better target now that you're married. You're more attractive. I don't know what their reasoning is. Maybe they think somebody has dealt with all the rough edges. This one is a finished product. I can handle this one now. I don't know. There are some people, by the way, they're not afraid of you being married. But listen, even as a married person, I believe you can choose to be faithful to your spouse regardless of the pressure of this world. You can choose to be that person who honors God with your body and decides his favor is more important than anything this culture is offering you. And I want to just say, uh, God's people, as we've gone through this series, I believe God in his love has brought us his word. He wants us to be different. He wants us to be unique. Ah, some of you have been in that place where you're saying, but pastor, I've messed up. I'm listening to this. There's some people who are so lucky. They're hearing this when they're young. They haven't made some of the decisions I've made. And I know there are some people here who are probably saying, pastor, if you knew the things I've been through, you wouldn't even look at me. Hey, listen, nobody's here to judge you. The one thing I love about the word of God is God, it tells us that God is love. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen. God is able to pick you up. Listen, there's nothing you can ever do that would be too much for God to redeem. There's no sin you could ever commit that Jesus' blood cannot forgive. And I want to say to somebody in this house that God is here to forgive you. And not just forgive you, but to purify you and to give you a whole different life. Where the past and the mistakes of your past become the platform that you will use to bless many people in your generation. Yeah, You're, by the way, one of my friends, uh, she, she's, she's divorced. And one of the things that she, she, she always tells me is, if you know anybody who's planning to be divorced, send them to me. So I can tell them the foolishness of what they're about to do. She's chosen that her mistake will not be the thing that defines her. She's chosen that God has forgiven me, God has redeemed me, the things I did in my youth, and now I want to use that as a platform to be a blessing. Yeah, God can use anything that you've done, any mistake, that, anything that the enemy intended for evil in your life. God can turn it for your good and the deliverance of many. 
And so I just want to pray for us right now because I believe that the Holy Spirit is here and He's convicting us and speaking to us. I want to just pray that God would open our hearts to understand that we are the generation. We are the generation that God is calling to stand up for Him in these universities, in the workplace, in our cities, to be different. That you are the people who are going to be salt and light to your generation. That you will not be like everybody else. Your marriages will be different. Your discipleship group will be different. Your relationships will be different. Because you know God. Because you know God. And you choose to honor God. And my prayer, Lord, for your people, is they will find favor with the Lord their God. I declare over this congregation that you are raising Noah's. You're raising men and women who are different. Yeah, we're not, we're not here because we're perfect, Lord. We're all here because we have issues. But Lord, you're raising us up to stand up and to be different in our generation. And I declare over you that the Lord will deliver you and give you a health, healthy relationships. And that not only that, but the generations that follow you will be blessed and healthy because of the life that God is going to cause you to live. I want to ask us to stand to our feet right now as we conclude. And there's a, a prayer that I want us to say together. This is just a prayer of declaration that I want us to say over ourselves and to say it before God. Can we just have the prayer up there? Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready, Mavuno? Yeah. All right. Let's say this prayer together. Come on, let's go. Lord Jesus Christ, I confess here and now that you are my creator and the creator of my sexuality. I love that. I acknowledge that you have ransomed me with your blood and that I have been bought with the blood of Jesus. My life and my body belong to you. Jesus, I present myself to you now to be made whole and holy in every way, including in my sexuality. You ask us to present our bodies to you as living sacrifices and the parts of our bodies as instruments of righteousness. I do this now. I present my body and my sexuality to you. Lord Jesus, I ask your forgiveness for every act of sexual sin. You promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I ask you to cleanse me of my unfaithfulness now. Cleanse my body, my soul, and my spirit. Cleanse my heart and mind and will, and cleanse my sexuality. Thank you for forgiving me and cleansing me. I receive your forgiveness and cleansing. I renounce every claim I've given to Satan, to my life or sexuality, through my sexual sin. Those claims are now broken by the cross and the blood of Jesus. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you for offering me total and complete forgiveness. I receive that forgiveness now. I choose to forgive myself for all my sexual wrongdoing. I also choose to forgive those who have harmed me sexually. I release them to you, Jesus. I release all my anger and judgment towards them. The cross is enough. Come, Lord Jesus, into the pain they caused me and heal me with your love. Lord Jesus, I now consecrate my sexuality to you in every way. I consecrate my sexual intimacy and commit it only to my spouse. I ask your healing grace to come and free me from all consequences of sexual sin. I ask you to fill my sexuality with your healing love and goodness. Restore my sexuality and wholeness. Let my spouse and me experience all of the intimacy and pleasure you intended a man and a woman to enjoy in marriage. Amen. I invite you, Holy Spirit of God, to fill our marriage bed now. Until or until the day that I intend to be married, I continue to consecrate my sexuality to Jesus Christ. And I pray all this in the name of of Jesus Christ, my Lord, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.